Okay, this is Sandy with Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance for our latest Sandy Says. I'm happy to say we are here with Deborah Fabos, one of our wonderful volunteers and a mental health advocate. And we'll go ahead and get started. Deborah, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Deborah Fabos. Um, I'm a mom of an adult who's diagnosed with a brain disorder. And uh, I'm happy to be here, Sandy. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm happy to have you on the call. Uh, please describe the organization you volunteer at and your role with it. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yes, I volunteer with Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. I do Families for Care Zoom support groups on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And we also have um, for our county in California, which is Kern County, we have our local chapter. Um, I guess we're called um, Community Champions for Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. We call it SNPAA for Kern County. And we work with our, our county's behavioral health and recovery services here. And how has your organization advocated for people with mental health issues? Well, at first we concentrated mainly on those on the spectrum with anosognosia and advocated for them. And by doing that, we worked with our county's AOT, or in our, in our state, it's called Laura's Law. And it's modeled after New York State's Kendra's Law, which is assisted outpatient treatment um, programs. So um, Fawn Desi started um, lobbying for Kern County to get assisted outpatient treatment programs here, which she succeeded at. And so that was, I believe, back in 2015. When it was implemented, though, it, it wasn't quite the way we had hoped. So Fondesi and I, um, under the director, excuse me, at Kern County Behavioral, um, we started a group called Chronic Psychosis. And it was a working group. So we worked with helping them revamp the AOT program here in Kern County. And they used Nevada County's AOT program as a model. That's wonderful. And could you talk a little bit more about your relationship with SNPAA? I know I've known you for several years now, <laughs> and, and I've referred people to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I also work with individuals in the county and also in other places in the state of California. Um, family members who are having difficulty getting services for their loved one and also maybe um, hooking them up with LEAP training, um, either through the Henry Amador um, um, organization or working with them individually on private Zoom meetings. And what kind of training is available for people interested in volunteering and or working in mental health? I know you have extensive training in different areas. Maybe you could talk about that. Oh, you're so kind. I don't know how extensive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do we get into comparisons? I don't like to get into comparisons. But um, uh, I think most of my uh, background is in just working with my son. You know, um, he exhibited behaviors, um, symptomatic behaviors, back when he was in preschool. So I started learning about different parenting techniques to try to work with those behaviors in a more positive way. When he was in um, second grade, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And so I started working with a um, child psychologist and we did behavior modifications for some of those behaviors. So I worked with behavior modifications with him through high school. And then when I was in, um, gosh, later on, um, I worked in a high school. It was a community-based instruction class and we had those on the autism spectrum and we also had those who were 
emotionally disturbed in our class and we used what's called applied behavioral analysis which is a you know a type of behavioral modification so i learned how to do that as well and i applied it to my son's behaviors because he was treatment resistant so until we could get him on clozapine trial that's what worked for him mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to find something to help with those symptomatic behaviors. So in my own experience, those were very helpful. And then in the more recent past, um, I did the um, peer specialist training. I am a certified peer specialist. Also, um, I am a LEAP um, trainer. I have uh, a certification in that. And I have taken a class in um, grief support and i hope to be able to get a certification in that as well and the grief support i think it's very interesting when i spoke to you about it it's it's not just having somebody pass away it can be having somebody who's still with us but there's grief could you talk about that a little bit sure for um family members like like my family, it's called ambiguous grief. Um, it's when you have someone who has changed. Usually it's referred to those with dementia. You know, there really, there really aren't any classes or support for families like mine. You know, when you have someone who has just started into the symptoms of psychosis, sometimes their personality can change. And it's uncertain for family members. We don't know what's going on yet. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing for us to tell us what is going on and what we can do and how we can help them. What can we expect? Will they come back? Will their personality come back? You know, and since it's a spectrum disorder, we, we're not told that. And we don't know, is, is this, a, you know, minimal? Is this maximum? Where, where are we on this? So that's what makes it so ambiguous. It's, it's the uncertainty of it all. So that ambiguous loss is what makes the, the grief almost like a frozen grief. And it makes it very unique. And the range of emotions can affect them personally. It can affect the relationship with their other loved ones and with the diagnosed loved one as well. So it's very important for family members to recognize when they're having those symptoms of grief and loss and how to get support for it. Well, thank you for explaining that. I know, you know, for my own journey, it, you know, it became just a di live, you know, day by day and, and, and just try to take baby steps and see where you end up. And, you know, I, I think I think that that is such a needed um, needed thing for for families going through this because you're right. I mean, you have no idea what the next day will bring or the next month or the next year. So um, can you describe the story you wrote in Dee Dee Ranahan's book, Tomorrow Was Yesterday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, what are your family's numbers? And um, that made reference to whenever we do hear people talk about those who are diagnosed with the neurodevelopmental disorders, um, we talk about those with the symptoms of psychosis, but we don't talk about what it's like for those who, who are their family members, their loved ones, and how it affects them. Because it does, you know, it does affect us. And um, so it, it's a ratio. And especially those on the spectrum who have anosognosia. You know, that, that is, is really impacts the life of the loved ones simply because the lack of services and support for us. You know, if we can address that and if we can increase those 
services and supports, mm -hmm. then I think we can decrease the impact in our lives. So for instance, with my son, um, for the one person that had the diagnosis, there were six of us whose lives were directly impacted. Mm -hmm. And it impacted us financially, emotionally. It impacted our day-to-day -day life for years. Yeah. You know, and it's sad. It really is. It shouldn't have to be that way. Right. And it affected the way we could support him. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was really sad. Yeah, and it's a it's a changing uh, role that you play. I know with my parents, you know, we it was like, okay, we're in crisis mode. Okay, well, today we're not. In, now we're not so much in crisis mode. What can we do? And you know, I always tell my mom she would have made a great nurse because she just you know <laughs> push, 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 try more, do more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You have to wear a lot of hats. Yeah, definitely. Can you say how a person can become a mental health advocate? Yes. Well, I, I you know, again, it's those hats that you wear. Mm -hmm. And it started with my son. You know, they, um, with those symptomatic behaviors, also came um, brushes with the law mm -hmm. and my having to advocate for treatment for him and not punishment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it first began, mm -hmm. you know, trying to educate the judges, educate the prosecutors that he doesn't need punishment. He needs treatment. Mm -hmm. that's and a really it, just, good point. it just grew from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the idea of reclassification of schizophrenia? Well, I'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> <laughs> because that is what brought me to SNPAA's doorstep mm -hmm. when um, SNPAA was SARTA. Mm -hmm. I was uh, debating um, whose wagon to jump on mm -hmm. at the time because there were so many good wagons, so many good causes to advocate and champion you know, this group of individuals and their families. And then, um, you know, I know a lot of individuals, a lot of advocates from way back. And I was speaking, I speak with Mary Palafox. And mm -hmm. uh, so she was looking too. And she says, hey, I, you know, I was looking at Sarda. Have you heard of them? Mm -hmm. And so that led us into a conversation. And she told me about the focus of the group. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm in, I am in 100% because although all the other groups have worthy focus mm -hmm. and important focus and things need to change in the direction they are concentrating in, mm -hmm. I see reclassification and looking at these as brain disorders and taking more of a medical approach in that way as the one thing that can make the most impact mm -hmm. and i said i'm there i can i can support that 250 percent mm -hmm. that's great and what did you think about the snpaa study on the cost of treating or not treating schizophrenia did you have a chance to look at that or i did um a while back um when it came out, um, mm -hmm. yes, of course. And, uh, you know, for those who like following the money, you know, I think it's, you know, it gives one pause. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Absolutely. What, what about, and it, it, I, I hope we played a role in this, but the, uh, what's your opinion on the recent news by SNPAA about the cost of mental illness act of 2022 introduced by two uh, United States representatives authorizing a study of the cost of serious mental illness on U S families, hospitals, nursing homes, and the penal system, as well as a national survey to determine the actual number of people living with a neurobiological disease. 
I have a very strong opinion about that, and it is it is about time. Mm -hmm. How do we know? No one has ever really seriously looked at that. So how do we know? And thank you, thank you, thank you for introducing that because it is it is way overdue. Mm -hmm. Well, I've gotten a lot of good information from you. Do you have any additional comments you'd like to make? Oh, um, gosh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, <laughs> No, please, just uh, for anyone watching this, it's a great organization. Sandy does wonderful work. Thank you. S&PAA <laughs> does great work. FFC does wonderful support for family members. Mm -hmm. Go to their organization, go to their website, and hit the donate button. It makes a difference. They make a difference and join us you can make a difference there's no little effort that's too small you can make a difference go to their website and find out how well thank you so much dobro for being on the call today and you can go to our youtube channel schizophrenia and psychosis action alliance so you don't miss any of the sandy says interviews i do have a great day